The coolest thing ever may be Titanium Damascus. Exhibit A, this Titanium Damascus axe made by Alex Steele. It is so cool that I want to make it myself. Trouble is, to make this, you need a few things that I don't have, like a welder, or a vacuum furnace, or an inert atmosphere. But what I do have is some material science knowledge, and I want to use that to take a slightly different approach. But to devise my plan of attack, I first need to understand why Titanium Damascus is so difficult to make in the first place. Titanium Damascus is made by metallurgically bonding different grades of titanium together, and then deforming and shaping this bonded titanium to create patterns within the metal. Titanium anodizes very beautifully, so you can take the resultant material you create and anodize it to bring out these beautiful colors. However, in order to successfully do this, you need two things. High temperatures and clean titanium. The high temperatures are no problem, but the clean titanium is immensely difficult. And that is because titanium is highly reactive to oxygen at elevated temperatures. At these high temperatures, you have two things working against you. The first thing is a formation of a titanium dioxide layer. This makes it very difficult for two pieces of titanium to bond together at high temperatures because the oxide is preventing that metal on metal contact. And the second thing that's working against us is the formation of alpha case. Alpha case is oxygen stabilized titanium in its alpha phase. Essentially at high temperatures, oxygen can diffuse into the spaces between titanium atoms and create a material that has a very low diffusivity for other elements. As we can see in the animation, the presence of alpha case makes it very difficult for atoms from one piece of titanium to diffuse into another. This prevents any sort of metallurgical bond from forming, and thus the pieces don't stick together. So, if I don't have an inert atmosphere, I'm going to be working against two things, the oxide formation as well as alpha case formation. So if I want to make layered titanium with my lack of supplies, I have to adjust my approach to deal with those two things rather than eliminate them. So instead of a diffusion bond, what if I relied on a chemical reaction to bind the two titanium pieces? What if between the two pieces of titanium, I included a metal that will chemically react with the titanium to bond the two pieces together? In other words, what if I formed an inner metallic interface? This approach doesn't care if there's alpha case, because the other metal would just react with the alpha case. It wouldn't have to diffuse through it. Now, the question becomes, what other metals should I use? There are lots of other metals that react with titanium to form intermetallic compounds, but the one I found most attractive is aluminum. This is for two reasons. One, because aluminum forms titanium aluminide at relatively low temperatures so I wouldn't have to worry as much about the formation of excessive oxide. And two, aluminum foil is cheap. So let's review the plan. Instead of diffusion bonding titanium to titanium, which requires extremely clean titanium with no alpha case and no oxide in an inert atmosphere, I'm instead going to rely on a second metal reacting with titanium to instead chemically bond two pieces together. However, this still leaves me with the problem of oxide but I'll deal with that in just a bit. First, let's get our initial layup of titanium and aluminum. I have these small titanium panels. These will serve as my titanium layers, and on some of them, I'm going to do a quick sanding to reduce the amount of oxide on the surface. Once I have my panels, I can begin the initial layup. Here I'm layering the titanium panels with the aluminum foil. I'm using different thicknesses of aluminum foil every now and then just to test if the amount of aluminum between the titanium makes a big difference or not. I also included some non-sanded titanium panels to see if sanding them actually mattered. Once I had everything wrapped, I wrapped everything again in another layer of aluminum foil. This would hopefully isolate the atmosphere just a little bit and reduce the amount of oxygen that makes it in. Once I had that wrapped, I repeated that process and wrapped it again in another layer of aluminum foil. However, within this layer, I included some small chips of scrap titanium. The aim is that these little chips of titanium serve as sacrificial pieces to attract the oxygen and form detrimental phases on themselves rather than the part that I'm actually interested in. Now I then took this entire stack up and wrapped it in stainless steel foil to further isolate the atmosphere. And with that, the stack up was done. However, I still had one more problem before I could begin processing, and that is oxidation. 
my plan to prevent oxidation at high temperatures is to do this entire reaction under high pressures. And the approach to that is really quite simple. I have two steel plates with fastener holes drilled all throughout the edges. I'll sandwich my stack up between these two steel plates and torque down fasteners in order to put the stack up under pressure. This high pressure will remove any air from between the layers, thus reducing the oxidation where it really counts. And now that I had that all torqued up, it was ready to start processing. So I put it in the furnace and turned the temperature up to 590 degrees Celsius, below the melting point of aluminum, but hot enough to allow the formation of titanium aluminide intermetallics. I kept it at this temperature for two hours. After that, I increased the temperature to above aluminum's melting point at 700 degrees Celsius to drive out any residual aluminum from the stack up. After soaking at this temperature for one hour, I turned the furnace off and allowed it to slowly cool overnight. After everything cooled, I could begin disassembling the pressure vessel and take out my sample. And kind of unsurprisingly, it looks pretty bad. And at this point, I was really wondering if there was any titanium at all left here or if everything was just converted to oxide. But there was only one way to find out, and that's grinding it down to get rid of this mess. So I nervously started grinding stuff down until I saw a resemblance of what looked like different layers. I was really happy when I saw these layers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's titanium. It could be all titanium aluminide. So I took this sample inside and gave it a quick anodize. And after that, it was quite obvious that these are in fact titanium layers because we got a clear, nice color change. So I continued grinding and shaping and sanding until I had something that looked like a pillow. And at this point, you could really see the layers of titanium and titanium aluminide, even before anodizing. But after anodizing, it looks even more striking. We can see that we have alternating layers of titanium, which changes color after anodizing, and titanium aluminide, which does not change color. It doesn't seem like the sanding of the titanium or the amount of aluminum between panels really made a difference, so I'm going to try making another one of these samples, however much thicker. So I repeated the entire process again. However, I lost one bolt on the pressure vessel to torquing it too hard. I didn't feel like replacing it, so I just sent it and did the heat treatment with one less bolt. Upon opening it up for the second time, we can see that our sample looks pretty similar. And again, I ground and polished this sample until I had something that looked like a pillow. I then anodized it, and you can see this beautiful pattern appears yet again. So this process is reproducible and consistently produces good results. Now let's talk about the practicality of this material. We know it grinds and shapes very well. But what we don't know is how it forges at high temperatures. However, I have a feeling that its forging performance is going to be subpar compared to traditional titanium Damascus. And this is simply because of the presence of intermetallics. Intermetallics, by their nature, are brittle. This is an electron microscope image that I took of the fracture surface of iron aluminide, a different type of intermetallic. And this fracture surface looked like something shattered. We can see it's very, very brittle. And this is essentially what we have holding together our layers of titanium. And despite there being only a small amount of this intermetallic, I imagine it wouldn't hold up well under deformation. So I'm no blacksmith, but if I had to guess, I'd say that this material is mostly good for just grinding into shape, not deforming into shape. However, that's pretty irrelevant to me. All I wanted was something that satisfied my eyes. And this completely achieves that goal. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed learning about this process just as much as I did. And make sure to subscribe for more material science related videos similar to this one. If you're interested in supporting us further, you can find our eBay and Etsy shops in the description, where we sell acrylic Lichtenberg figures. We've also just started a Patreon, and for a limited time, we will ship new Patreon supporters a 2x2 Lichtenberg figure at no additional cost. But again, thank you so much for watching and enabling us to be able to make these videos. We're very passionate about these subjects and love sharing it with you guys.